Why do I get so sweaty? As soon as I get in here, I have full sweat on my mustache, and I had to pin my bangs back, and I had to put my hair up. Meanwhile, Drury looks like a mermaid, a pretty one. I look like I'm in PE class. <laughs> On this week's episode of Art of the Short, Jory and Bethers question convertibles of the Naked Girl variety, take a crack at consumerism, and claim their rightful place in the Pacific Northwest's Moon Breast Society. We'd like to remind you that all episodes of Art of the Short contain explicit content and a masterful amount of spoilers. If you'd like to read the story before entering, a free link is provided in our show notes. Or if you give no f**ks whatsoever, just keep listening. Art of the Short is an interactive literary art installation. We overextend our opinions on short stories and make art of our interpretations. Like Jory might make a film featuring slow motion cheese grating, where she lists various cheeses in an ASMR whisper. Stuff like that. Join in the conversation and send us your artwork to add to the gallery at artoftheshort.com and follow the installation on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Art of the Short to see what others think of this short story through their art. Hi, Bethany. Hey, Tori. It's like you forgot my name halfway through, Bethany. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Hi. How was your art this week? Oh, it's a bit of a roller coaster. It was um a walk down memory lane. Let's put it that way. A walk down memory lane. Mm-hmm. 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 Decades. A decades of walking. <laughs> I'm excited. <laughs> Um, is it going to be like a collage of like arcade faces? <laughs> no, I could I could submit that though. I'm sure there's lots of those. <laughs> oh my god! And you? Et toi? Yeah. I don't know how to say and you in Italian. E E two? Dose? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know Italian either. I don't really. I don't know how I feel about this week. To be honest, mm-hmm. I think the story for me was a little hard for me to get into a little bit. Sure. Had to read it more than once. Sure. I don't know. I mean, I'm happy with what I got. I'm happy with it, but it it was definitely not like something I was like excited <laughs> to show you or I don't know. I don't know. I feel pretty like neutral middle of the road. Yeah. Very neutral. Mm, okay. <laughs> I know. Not, not, that was not I very exciting. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, we'll just see. Okay. This week's short story is by the highly revered author Italo Calvino. With inventive structure and floating perspectives, this multi-award winning author is known for examining the nature of chance, coincidence, and change. A journalist, whimsical short story writer, and novelist, Calvino's imaginative and playful tales propelled his career and crowned him one of the most important Italian fiction writers in the 20th century. For any Calvino fans who may be listening, I apologize for what you're about to hear. This week, we read Daughters of the Moon by Italo Calvino. The Daughters of the Moon. He wrote this in 1968 (laughs) just to set the stage. Oh, was it? That makes more sense now. Such a 60s piece. (laughs) I had to read this more than once, Mm. like I had mentioned. (laughs) Same, like four times for me. (laughs) And then I had to have it read to me like a bedtime story because I still couldn't (laughs) quite get it get it together yeah it's like a 60s art house piece but in written form 100 percent. yeah 100 percent. it starts with i don't know like a consciousness voice if you will it's like okay but even before that quickly there's a piece of trivia or something like some fun facts about the moon yeah the fun facts are that the moon is constantly being broken down by atmospheric attacks, basically. Yes. And I think this is supposed to be a real fact. At least in 1968, it was yeah. like a real fact. So who knows if it really is accurate, <laughs> present day accurate. But he he worked under the premise that it was. So that's the opening. Also, we didn't even go to the moon until 1969, right? <laughs> I don't, truly don't know, but good for you for knowing. Maybe that maybe that was inspired where he does it. <laughs> maybe that's what he was inspired by. <laughs> So yeah, it starts with like this kind of like consciousness voice in my perspective, Mm -hmm. where it's kind of like past, present, future, all time, Mm -hmm. all knowing kind of voice talking about the moon. And it's like the moon is old. (laughs) And then it's like, would you like to tell us the name of the speaker? QFWFQ. This person's name is 
It's quiff with cook. Chuf. Kafakia. Quiff quiff. That's disrespectful. <laughs> quiff quiff is so disrespectful. Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's Q F W F Q. And I think we should just read the opening. Go ahead. This is how it opens. The moon is old. Quiff Q agreed. <laughs> <laughs> Pitted with holes, worn out. Rolling naked through the skies, it erodes and loses its flesh like bone that's been gnawed. This is not the first time that such a thing has happened. I remember moons that were even older and more battered than this one. I've seen loads of these moons, seen them being born and running across the sky and dying out. One punctured by hail from shooting stars, another exploding from all its craters, and yet another oozing drops of topaz-colored sweat that evaporated immediately, then being covered by greenish clouds and reduced to a dried-up, spongy shell. Yes. So it is like this all-knowing... Being. It's definitely a being. That has seen all time and space. Yes. So then it says... The one moon that happened on Earth, this one's hard to describe. So let me just tell you a little story about when the moon died on Earth. Yes. Planet Earth, the Earth that we know, it's set in New York City, Manhattan, USA. (laughs) And our main character, who continues to be this being, but now is like a normal human man, is driving a convertible. I really just thought we should note that. It seemed really funny and random. Like, who drives a convertible in Manhattan? So many thoughts about this. What a funny choice. (laughs) And he's driving along when he notices in the park a naked woman who he refers to as a girl, which I find very upsetting and I can go on about at a later time. (laughs) So... He sees a naked girl. Her clothes are everywhere and her shopping bags are everywhere. She has long hair, light skin, and he is drawn to her. He's like pulled to her as if by the tides of the moon, like an orbit. He can't help himself. He like pulls over, approaches her, and she is just like something's up with her. She starts walking towards the moon, I suppose we could say, right? Yeah, and he loses her. Yeah. Next thing he knows, she is crouched (laughs) on the back of his convertible, (laughs) naked. He notices that there are these moon girls, moon women, naked moon women. On all the cars. On all the cars. (laughs) All the cars. All the cars. These women are (laughs) leading them to this junkyard. Yes, they're naked and they raise their arms. (laughs) Like, get in a circle form, right? They'd get in, like, a witch circle, pagan witch circle, to hold up the moon. They have their face and their breasts towards the moon. Pointing towards the moon. As a note. Just as a note, okay? (laughs) Earth at this point in time is at the point where people just want to, like, work and work and work and then buy, buy, buy. And if anything that they own even has like the slightest dent in it or something, they get rid of it. They have to have everything brand new. Everything has to be perfect. Everything has to be shiny and clean and beautiful. And yeah, that's why the landfill is so full. Yeah. And here comes the um, enemy of the story. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> the crane. <laughs> to take the moon out of the sky because it's like an ugly disturbance. They're embarrassed by it. Yeah. And it reaches into the sky and it bites the moon out of the sky. You think it's not going to happen as the reader, <laughs> but it does. It bites it like shark's jaws. And now the moon is like a dead, ugly pumice stone rock. The rock falls to the ground. These worker men put a metal net around it, and I think they're going to put it in the junkyard. And then the, like, moon daughters (laughs) take the net. And then the net pulls them to the sea, as well as some, like, quote-unquote deplorables. Yeah. And then here's kind of a fun scene, which I want to mention, which is that it's Thanksgiving Day, and it's the Macy's Day Parade. And so there's women... And they're holding the parade floats. And so now there's these two... Merging parades. <laughs> yeah, and they join. And then all the women holding the parade floats also get naked. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, the scrapyard comes to life. Let's not forget things about that. Things are coming alive and things are dying. Which yes. one is it? <laughs> Ugh, I was so confused. The moon is at this point floating again. Because of their belief in power or whatever. Yeah, because the moon the moon daughters will leave power. I hope everyone's following this. <laughs> It's pretty obvious what's happening. (laughs) And they dunk the moon into the sea. And the moon ladies jump in after it. They're pulled in. Okay. (laughs) Then the moon emerges from the water and it's 
beautiful. It's green. It's fecund. It's filled with jungles, peacock looking. <laughs> the women now are just part of the moon and they're like, bye, see ya. And it jumps into the sky and the sun rises. All the men are in a frenzy, it says, that the moon has been rebirthed. And then let me read you, to your listener, the finale, yeah, the final <laughs> sentence. Because he's saying, there they are, there she is. And he sees like his little girlfriend that was on his car. Here's the, the final <laughs> paragraph. <clears throat> we were seized by a frenzy. We began to gallop across the continent, through the savannas and forests that had recovered the earth burying cities and roads, obliterating all trace of what had been. And we trumpeted, lifting up to the sky our trunks and our long, thin tusks, shaking the shaggy hair of our croups with the violent anguish that takes hold of all of us young mammoths. (laughs) When we realize that now is when life begins, and yet it is clear that what we desire, we shall never have. I... Okay. Um, what? <laughs> That's a wrap. <laughs> I don't know if it's because I am um, a moon daughter of the Pacific Northwest. Oh boy. She's card carrying <laughs> member, Pacific Northwest chapter. <laughs> but like, I thought it was going to be maybe a little bit more like folklore fantasy, like an Ursula Le Guin type, like earth seed type vibe. Totally. Where there, it's like more women centric and like yes. maybe the reader leaves understanding the power of women in a more like totally. mystical way, but one that you know is totally. true, like in reality. I'll say that I opened it. It's in the New Yorker. It has this beautiful illustration, this like Renaissance fairy looking naked lady and twinkly lights. And then it has this like super science-y opening and I could see that the setting was on the moon. And so I was actually very excited. Like I was like, oof, this is going to be super cool sci-fi. Like it's Italian, like that's so interesting, like a different perspective. I really just thought it was going to be Italian feminist (laughs) (laughs) sci-fi. And what it was pretty inexplicably was set in America (laughs) That's not why I came to this Italian writer, to hear him speak about being a first-hand New Yorker, which he's not. So that was an unwelcome surprise. And I kind of was into it. I was into it enough. Like, I was put off by him calling all these grown women girls. I didn't care for that. It put a real bad taste in my mouth. Yeah. Because obviously they have adult women's bodies, so let's not call them girls. It's very confusing and infantilizing. Um, Yeah. And I liked I liked when they were on the cars and I liked when they made the drum circle and lifted up the moon. Like I was there for that. But then it just kept going <laughs> and going and going and I fully lost the plot. Like I didn't know what was happening anymore. I read it in three different sittings and then I read that we're mammoths now and we have trunks and I just closed my iPad and just walked <laughs> away <laughs> entirely. Yeah. Because I was confounded. Yeah. I mean, I was thinking like consumerism and like human evolution. Those are like the big takeaways. How it was done (laughs) was sprawling. 60s art house. There was Mm -hmm. like 10 different things happening. It was imaginative. You got to give him that. It was imaginative. I have to say I read it the first time and was so distracted by two things. One, the little scientist in me was like, rolling my eyes about the moon not being in the sky anymore and being like, oh my God, like... Nothing would work. How can they just function without it? Yes. <laughs> All the things that actually wouldn't work. Yes, yes. Um, and then I was like, Jory, this is like, you know, just go along for the ride. <laughs> but then they started, he started talking about like mm-hmm. naked girls on cars and I was like, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> like, of course, on a convertible. Yeah. And actually, I don't even know if they identify their gender. Mm-mm. But the whole time you think it's a man. Of course. And I was like, oh my God. And then everything that you said, like grown women being called <laughs> girls and like. Not welcome. Yeah, not welcome. <laughs> So I read the whole thing just like really with a thick attitude. Sure. I took a break from it and came back and read it again. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, I can get with this. (laughs) Yeah. Like I can get with it. You have to go along for the ride. Like you have to be prepared just to like whatever happens Mm -hmm. in this like sexy moon daughter Jumanji. (laughs) It is kind of like that. Like anything is happening. (laughs) 
Um, I will say about Italo's work that he did make me feel some strong emotions around my protectiveness and defensiveness of the moon. Mm. I came into this thinking the moon was going to be held up and revered, which it kind of is, but this culture is really dismissive of it yeah, and doesn't really revere it until these moon women are like possessed by this moon spirit. The culture is really dismissive, the human American culture here. Yeah. He spends a lot of time describing the moon as like molded and broken and sharded and like garbage and like... A chewed up piece of cheese rind. Yeah, I felt very protective and defensive that they would speak about it this way and that like it could come out of the sky and just like fall to the ground like it was nothing yeah I found it very offensive (laughs) yeah dude and just scientifically I'm telling you I was like this the whole time I was cursing the science behind it but you know I guess the mammoth turn at the end Mm -hmm. for me was um welcome yeah. There was like a long stretch there where there was just a lot of description and a lot of gibberty jabberty. Yeah. So when all of a sudden we got prehistoric elephant creatures, <laughs> I was like, wow, you went there. Like, good for you, Italo. Like, I was grateful for this like full circle, like cyclical yeah. story of rebirth that he went so dramatic. Because yeah. if, in case we're not making it clear, reader, like what he's saying is that like, the earth and the moon are regenerating and they're starting from scratch and we're like in prehistory and we're going to grow a whole new culture all over and do this again and again and again. Because the opening is so like feels omnipresent, I expected us to go back there somewhere in the end, Mm -hmm. back into this perspective where you're all knowing and you understand like some cycles of life or whatever. Yeah. I did appreciate the ending too, just like you. I was like, okay. Did not see that coming. Didn't see you running through the savannas <laughs> as a mammoth, but, you know, I'm there for it, I guess. <laughs> I guess. Yeah, we're like, I guess. <laughs> the naked girls and the breasts, like, and the faces and the breasts, it's like, what's the point? There was no point. <laughs> there was no, like, the women are holding it up because of this thing. I mean, we're supposed to think it's a comment on, like, naturalness versus consumerism like because they're dropping their shopping bags and they're getting rid of all the things that separate them from earth and planet or the moon in this case but i guess i mean like why aren't there naked men or naked boys i should say great question why aren't they supporting the moon with their dicks towards the moon (laughs) shining because moons are feminine energy they're not responsible for this. But that's what I'm saying. Like, there was no tie-in. There was no, like... It was taken for granted, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, overall, my biggest criticism of this piece is just, like, how moralistic it is and how heavy-handed it is. Like, yeah. he even describes the god of production as who the Americans are praying to on Thanksgiving Consumerism Day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know how I feel about this one. This is an example of postmodern literature, which just means, like... We now are going to start playing with unreliable narrators and we're going to be self-referential and meta and we're going to do weird things with the text that have never been done. This is that. Yeah. 60s art house. He (laughs) is talking a lot about clothes. You're not mending your clothes. You're just throwing them away. Like your shoes outlast your car. Like all these just different things that are happening. And I wanted the dear listener to know that Jory is very good at not being like a consumer and she takes good care of her things and buys things that are going to last a long time. And I think you really, you are very anti-consumer in that way. I don't know. That's a really nice thing to say though. Cause I always think like, God, I could do so much better. I think it's just how you were raised. Again, Pacific Northwest mentality. When he's like being so luxury about this, I was like, well, there's one person he couldn't lecture. Oh, but it is true. Thanks. Oh, I have a really important analysis. This is breaking news. I think this is really going to blow the top off your convertible. Um, <laughs> oh God. It's the following. I think the film, the John Favreau, Will Ferrell starring vehicle Elf is a ripoff of Italo Calvini's The Daughters of the Moon. They're both set in Central Park. They're both about having to come together and do some sort of ritual to make the magic happen. (laughs) The climactic scene in Elf is everyone coming together and having to sing Christmas songs to spread Christmas cheer so that Santa's sleigh will rise over Central Park. And that's literally the same plot of Daughters of the Moon. 
they gather around and raise the moon with their belief and their whatever. So, I've never seen Elf. Oh my God. Jory. I don't know, man. I don't know. Your lack of support <laughs> for me while I was telling that story was. Blank face. <laughs> it's like. <laughs> I folded my arms, listener. I'm very upset at this <laughs> revelation. Does Zoe Deschanel get naked and put her breasts to the moon? She is naked in the shower scene, but <gasps> you don't get to see her. She's naked knees in the shower scene? And it's very innocent and very sweet. What would you rate the Daughters of the Moon? I don't know why I got so quiet just then. This is very serious. The time has come. I would give this story two out of five naked lunar girls naked lunar girls i think i'm gonna surprise you i'm gonna give it a whopping three whoa three out of five naked lunar girls really why well because okay it was not the greatest but then i also appreciate things that are just totally out of the fucking blue (laughs) it does have that going for it i gave it the extra point because it's a, a wild ride it is a ride. And I had to read it twice. I read it probably four times and then listened to it on tape. Yeah. I couldn't wrap my mind around it. I could not wrap my mind around what is happening here. Okay. Art of the short. Art of the short. Art of the short. You're so pissed right now. <laughs> But then he just gave me rat face because she was annoyed at me, <laughs> first of all. And then it was a passionate rat face. It was like a very upset rat face. <laughs> um, and then he glared at me. <laughs> Art of the short. Art Woo! of the short. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me what you're seeing. Bethany sent me a few photos. And the first one is, I mean, I know exactly what it is. Oh, yes, of course you do. Of course I do. Oh, yeah, of course you do. (laughs) Did you say you're Swedish? It's the meatballs. Yeah. (laughs) I am Swedish. (laughs) That sounded like you're Irish. Oh, Oh, yeah. Like a leprechaun, like the really like stereotypical leprechaun accent. (laughs) Mm. This is a drawing of a Klimt painting. Mm Mm-hmm. The first picture that she sent me is a sketch, and I can't remember what the name of this one is. Blood of Fish. It was in 1897, Gustav Klimt. So if you aren't familiar with this, it is these beautiful naked women who are swimming with fishes. Like underwater fish, yeah. It's so beautiful. It's like, they're just some of my favorites. I love Klimt, by the way, and Bethany does too. So the next one I'm looking at, oh, okay, so it's a video and she's colored it. I think it's watercolor. Mm-hmm. Is this also on canvas? Mm-hmm. You're getting like legit over here. <laughs> I have like, a lot to I, say about it. Yeah, I don't have any canvas. I'm gonna. I need to like up my game. Mm-hmm. And so it's these beautiful like goddess women naked with this gorgeous long hair swimming. Tits up, breast to the moon. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's even more to explain. Okay. When I get into my arts and crafts box, Mm -hmm. it's all stuff from when we were youths and we would make art together in high school and stuff. Like, I still have a lot of that stuff. And I had this... That's lovely. Yeah, I had this notebook of canvas sheets. So it's like in like an artist's notebook. And I didn't want to get rid of it. It's like perfectly good canvas. Yeah. And then that sketch that I sent you in pencil is from that period. Probably when we lived in Seattle. Are you serious? So like that sketch, yes, is from like 2003. Oh my God. Yeah, it's super faded. It's just pencil on canvas. I have to look at this And again. I was trying to draw Gustav Klimt's painting. It's not a painting. It's actually ink print called Blood of Fish. He was actually experimenting with Japanese style in that time. And then so I pulled out my mom's Chinese brush set with the ink because I saw this piece and I was like, well, this is perfect. perfect. Like, this is totally, totally perfect. And it's very like high schooly for me, like yeah. MC Escher, yeah, Gustav yeah, yeah, Klimt, yeah. sort of like that period of my life. Yeah. And then I read the end of the story where it says that the new moon and the new earth looks like jungly peacock feathers. Yeah. So then I just decided to watercolor peacock colors into the background. I am floored. Just the fact that that's something that you mm-hmm. had. 
when we were like little babies. Isn't that so funny? Like it's coming full <laughs> circle. I'm not kidding. I'm like tearing up a little bit. Like just our art history that we have together. Well, I mean, Jory made us get my art set out. I yeah. Know. You know, to pay respect to Klimt and my history and the watercolor, I would have liked to spend another hour on it. But it's, you know, that's how this works. Like we got, we got to do what we can in the time that we have with yeah, the things that we have. Totally. That's the exercise. Yes, absolutely. So that's where we're at. I'm going to look at yours. It's on a black backdrop and it's a spinning orb, kind of moon looking kind of glowy. It's made out of, I don't know, lights. It looks like dried Plant life lights. <laughs> <laughs> Try plant life lights. <laughs> it's a moon, and I decided to take my recycling that I have in my house <laughs> because so much of the story is about junkyard metal scraps. <laughs> yes. See, I told you you're resourceful. I told you. <laughs> was so I right I or was my I right? Junkyard metal scraps that were in my recycle. Okay. And I punched a bunch of holes in them. I was going to try to shine light through it so it was really glowy, but it was not working. And so I ended up wrapping mm-hmm. these like metal Christmas lights that I have around it. What is the what is the main body of the thing that I'm looking at? It's aluminum. Aluminum. Aluminium. It's really cool. So yeah, just the idea of just like taking my recycling and making it into a moon. It's beautiful. I hoped, I really was like hoping you would make some moon art. Um, because you are a card carrying <laughs> Pacific Northwest moon child. I have to. I can't not. Yes. <laughs> yes. Just like you are. It's I like, do want to bear my breast to the moon. So we have borne our breasts in the moon. Of course. Is that how you say it? Born mm-hmm. them? Bo- I don't know now. No, I don't know now. Bore them? How do you say that? <laughs> I don't know now. Bear? There was this one time. Can I tell this? Yeah, what? I'm going to tell this. I don't know what you're going to I have no idea what you're going to say. It was very foggy out and we were staying at this Airbnb on a lake and um, there was a dock that went into the water (laughs) and it was in the middle of the night and I was like, we need to go like be like one with the moon or something. And we all took our tops off and went and laid on the dock topless with our breasts and our faces (laughs) to the moon. (laughs) And like just hung out there for like a couple hours, just like talking. And I don't remember that. Yes, it was my doing. <laughs> like all I remember is what happened later, which is that pants jumped into the lake, and then we found out that there was a high algae warning, and she like, oh. could have gotten a disease, <laughs> <laughs> and she couldn't get out of the lake. Wasn't it also like only like two feet deep? <laughs> it, she like dove in and it was up to her calf. Like me. <laughs> <laughs> so we have been moon women. Tits to the moon. <laughs> <laughs> That's sweet. Bethany, I loved your art this week. I just have to say. Thank you. Art of the short. Art of the art short. Of the short. <laughs> On the next episode of Art of the Short Little Shorties, we will read The Sapper Wharf Hypothesis by Kate Tooley. As always, a link to this short story is provided for you in the show notes. We really want to hear what you think about uh, the Daughters of the Moon and Mr. Italo Calvino's take on (laughs) women in cars. And we really want to see your artwork. So send us your art at artoftheshort.com and follow the installation on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Art of the Short and be a part of the installation. Okay, bye. Bye. I am going to (laughs) bite your other boob. (laughs) Oh, well, maybe they'll match then. I'm very concerned I'm going to have an irregular set. <laughs> like, your one nipple's just going to turn a little bit more. <laughs> we were perfectly matched before. Now I don't know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God.